Hello beautiful friends, welcome back to another reading vlog. Uh, this week I want to focus mostly on 100 years of solitude, like make this vlog mostly about this book because um, you know, we're doing this read along. We're doing this read along together and I've been getting a lot of questions about when the next little updates on this in video form are going to be out. So that's mostly what we're going to be focusing on, but I also want to take you just with me throughout my week. I have some other reading updates. First things first, today is Tuesday. I'm actually almost done three books. Like I'm this close to finishing three different books this morning. It's not even morning anymore. It is 2.23, um, but this morning I have been pretty productive. I went to a yoga class this morning. I did a bunch of content planning. I have a number of very busy weeks and weekends coming up, so I've been doing huge content planning into the future, and as well I'm trying to book my train tickets home today, actually. And then I also called my grandma, and I called my mom, and I caught up with them, so... Yes, and I've been planning just so many different things. This is the goal for right now. This is what I just want to do really quickly because like I said, I'm so close to finishing all three of these. So first up, I am that much of the way through The Stone Sky. I have two hours and 21 minutes and 21 seconds left on it, but I'm listening to it at like two point something speed. So um, I'll probably finish that today or tomorrow, but then these are the two that I am almost done. So I have 10 pages left on A Wild Cheap Chase. I was reading this um, in bed last night and then I was just like, you know what? I have to go to bed with 10 pages left. Can you believe I did that to myself? This book is cracked. This book is so cracked and I love it so much. It's so crazy. Um, so many updates on this one, but I'm gonna try to finish it before I go through any of my thoughts. And then I have, I think, 10, also 10 pages left on the Cossacks. What is happening? Um, but I have 10 pages left on the Cossacks by Tolstoy, so I'm gonna finish that up too. So I think what I'm gonna do is finish the Cossacks first, and then I'm gonna finish A Wild Sheep Chase, and then we're gonna talk. Okay, someone is gonna die. Someone's gonna die. Either one person or the other person. Someone. That's my prediction. Oh my god! <laughs> What's that? What the frick was that? You scared the- You scared me! Alright, so that is the Cossacks done. I think I'm gonna give it a solid three stars and you will hear my thoughts in the live show, which will be, I think, the first Saturday in September. Oh my gosh, September. Um, but yeah, okay, I finished this. Let's finish A Wild Sheep Chase, which is the book that I'm like, I wanna finish that one so badly. So I just finished a wild sheep chase as well and then I just spent a long time like reading <laughs> about it because it was one of those um, that I just needed to hear someone else's thoughts on. I really like this is what I will tell you. I really thoroughly enjoyed this. Four stars I think. This is about a man who goes looking for a sheep and somehow like I just feel empty and so sad that this is over. I loved reading this so much. I did um, tab a few more things. I don't know if these are exactly quotes or what. I don't know, it's that feeling you get when you finish a Murakami novel because nothing is really wrapped up and that's part of the beauty of it. You are left with a lot more questions. Um, and I guess like I did just read that it's been called, or I don't think Murakami himself calls it 
this, but it's a very apt description that um, a lot of the detective or detective-inspired novels that he writes are actually anti-detective fiction because um, they don't present you with a solution at the end, they don't help you, they don't wrap it up for you. There are just some other nice quotes like, um, the rain kept falling at the same rate from my hotel window through the neon signs of the building next door. A hundred thousand strands of rain sped earthward through a green glow. I don't know. There's just something really, really nice. Like, other image I really like. I've been tracking, or, like, trying to track cats throughout Murakami because they're a very common creature, a very common thing that shows up. But our unnamed protagonist does have a cat. And then when he goes on this quest for the sheep, um, he kind of has to leave the cat with the very scary, powerful, suited and booted, very rich man. <laughs> but he's like, please take my cat. This is the description of the cat that this man has to do. It's just like such a funny image in my mind. It says, don't feed him fatty meat. He throws it all up. His teeth are bad, so no hard foods. In the morning, he gets milk and canned cat food. In the evening, a handful of dried fish or meat or cheese snacks. Also, please change his litter box daily. He doesn't like it dirty. He often gets diarrhea, but if it doesn't go away after two days, the vet will have some medicine to give him. He's starting to get lice in his ears. So once a day, you should give his ears a cleaning with a cotton swab and a little olive oil. He dislikes it and fights it. So be careful not to rupture the eardrum. Also, if you're worried he might claw the furniture, trim his claws once a week. Regular nail clippers are fine. I'm pretty sure he doesn't have fleas, but just in case, it might be wise to give him a flea bath every so often. After his bath, you should dry him off with a towel and give him a good brushing. Then last of all, a once over with a hair dryer. Otherwise, he'll catch cold. And the cat doesn't have a name at this point, but then they give him a name and they decide to call him Kipper. Um, and it's just, it's so, I just thought that was funny. One of the final destinations that we get to go to, um, it's a house and it was just odd as if a great creature had grown old without being able to express its feelings. Not that it didn't know how to express them, but rather that it didn't know what to express. Anyway, I loved it. I loved it. I have so much to think about. I'm gonna be thinking about this book for like forever now, and that's what I love about Murakami. Um, I would highly recommend this one. And as well, this is part of the series, like I was saying, the rat series, but you can read them out of order. As well, I did just want to mention, give you guys an update on the Murakami playlist, the songs that I did find in here, because there were a few. Um, what do we have? Okay, so we had three Johnny River songs mentioned. We have Midnight Special, Roll Over Beethoven, Secret Agent Man, oh, sorry, and one more, Johnny Be Good. Um, so those four, all from Johnny Rivers. And then we also have somehow the main title from Star Wars played by Maynard Ferguson, which sounds like this. Yep. And uh, the last two we have is Perfidia by Percy Faith and his orchestra. And then the last one was Air Mail Special by Benny Goodman. Some music that came out of here, not too much compared to his first book, but I think the next Murakami book is a lot more about music in general. So yeah, it's just really cool because a lot of, there was just a lot in here that is reflected in a few of his later works I've read. So really like this. So sad it's over. I had a great time and I highly recommend.
time of day to read some more of this. I am currently 208 pages through, so definitely a bit further than when I last talked to you, and so much has happened in those kind of few 100 pages that it's insane. Um, if you guys are reading this, there will be spoilers for up to, you know, 200 pages into this, but spoilers in 100 Years of Solitude are, except for the ending, I would say, aren't too big of a deal because this book is just like a constant deluge of <laughs> things happening, things that keep on happening. So of course there was the war um, in Colombia that is represented in this book between the liberals and conservatives, and that's where Colonel Aureliano Buendia gets his name, gets his title, because he starts to fight for the liberal party, he becomes very famous. At the point I am now, the war is technically over, and he has retired into making his little gold fish that he then sells for gold, which he then makes more gold fishes with. So it's just this vicious cycle, but there has been so many good quotes. Jose Arcadio's son um, has been shot because he was the one who um, took over the government, or I guess the military, and in Macondo. And Colonel Orleano was like, hey, you know, I'm leaving this to you, but then Arcadio um, kind of just became this tyrant and eventually things did not go his way and he was shot. Um, but before he is shot, he gets into a relationship and I believe marries this woman named Santa um, Sofia. They have a daughter who they name Remedios, the beauty who becomes the most like beautiful woman ever, ever in uh, apparently the whole world. And they also have twins, twin boys, who they name Aureliano Segundo and Jose Arcadio Segundo who may or may not get switched somewhere along the way. Rebecca, who was living with Jose Arcadio because they were the couple that got married, one mysterious day, um, Jose Arcadio goes into his bedroom, closes the door, and then the sound of a pistol shot echoed through the house. A trickle of blood came out under the door, across the living room, went out into the street, continued on in a straight line across the uneven terraces, went down steps and climbed over curves, and eventually makes its way to Ursula. And that's how they find out that Jose Arcadio the um, second generation, I guess, of the, the family in Macondo is dead. And no one knows who shot him or if he shot himself or what was kind of happened there. Jose Arcadio Buendia, the father of the whole line who founded Macondo, he is now dead. It's one of the most, I think, beautiful passages from the book is about his death. Through the window, they saw a light rain of tiny yellow flowers falling. They fell on the town all through the night in a silent storm, and they covered the roofs and blocked the doors and smothered the animals who slept outside. So many flowers fell from the sky that in the morning the streets were carpeted with a compact cushion, and they had to clear them away with shovels and rakes so that the funeral procession could pass by. Just those tiny flowers falling from the sky. It's just so, it's just, ah, oh, it's so beautiful. A relationship begins, another not good one, <laughs> between Amaranta and... Uh, who? And Aureliano Jose, who is the son of Colonel Aureliano Buendia. Aureliano also goes off to war, but it says he found her in the dark bedrooms of cap captured towns, especially in the most abject ones, and he would make her materialize in the smell of dry blood on the bandages of the wounded, in the instantaneous terror of the danger of death at all times and in all places. He had fled from her in an attempt to wipe out her memory, not only through distance, but by means of a muddled fury. But the more her image wallowed in the dunghill of war, the more the war resembled Amaranta. That was how he suffered in exile, looking for a way of killing her with his own death. People just keep like winding themselves tighter and tighter into their own little balls of solitude and desolation and aloneness. Colonel Aureliano Buendia um, goes so far as to make his like associates, I guess, in, in the war and like you know, the people under his power, draw a line of chalk around him that no one is allowed to enter. I think it's like 10 feet or something, yeah. Um, so he now he's like literally sealed himself off from human connection and no one can enter his circle of chalk. Along the way, the colonel also has 17 sons um, from different women that he encounters in the war and they're all named Aureliano. Jose Arcadio Segundo and Aureliano Segundo start taking on um, these traits that Ursula has come to recognize as like features of the Aureliano line and the Jose Arcadio line. Um, and then 
they kind of start to embody and do the exact same things like fighting over or having relationships with the same woman, becoming obsessive in different ways, um, their hobbies are the same and Ursula's like, I know all of this by heart. It's as if time had turned around and we were back at the beginning. It's just, it's still so good. Like it's just filled with things that really just hit you that are just absolutely wonderful. Like Amarantha, um, he says, whose melancholy made the noise of a boiling pot. When your melancholy makes the noise of a boiling pot. This thing that will be important a lot later as well, but um, the war is over, right? We want to say uh, the Colonel has signed the treaty that there's going to be peace and so Makondo is really flourishing it's going through another huge boom and they decide to throw a carnival but in the middle of this carnival um, these people who are dressed up as just people of the carnival open fire on the crowd and they say long live the liberal party long live Colonel Aureliano Buendia no one really knows who they are the colonel is not responsible for them he's kind of given up all hopes and dreams of his war that has kind of ruined his life and these huge events of violence that aren't ever taken responsibility for, that no one ever claims, that the government never um, gives any truth or light or answer to, even though they're always like, oh, we're investigating. Um, that's a huge part of like magical realism itself as a genre because the truth that these people don't even give to, for example, the people of Makondo, obviously in the book, becomes so twisted, it takes on different lives of its own, it's always open to speculation and possibility, people have their own versions of what happens and that is to an extent what magical realism is because when you read, when you read, you know, that someone gets shot and the line of blood has a mind of its own and travels up different streets and through people's houses, it's not, it's not something that happens in reality but um, in this book it is because truth can be whatever you want it to be, especially when you learn that fact from people in power who dissemble and deceive you over and over again and make the truth whatever they want to be and I think magical realism, at least some essays that I've read, is um, to some extent a response to that um, mutilation of truth in everyday life, especially in the government, especially in politics. It's just like, okay, well, what is the actual account? What is happening? And magical realism is part of that commentary on truth and reality and um, reality because reality is just what is obviously constructed. So anyway, I'm 208 pages through and I'm gonna sit down and read a little bit more. Oh wait, oh man, tomatoes. Look at them all. Peppers. Ooh, who's eating the, uh, is this broccoli? Yeah. yeah, I already cut the full head off and that's another one growing where I cut one yeah. off. <laughs> Look at this big man. That is one big snake. I want to touch you so bad. Hi, baby.
I got home from my trip home to a lovely package from the company Everlasting. They are a small business that creates lovely bedding sets from pillowcases to comforters. They have different kinds of bedding sets. They were all so cute that I really struggled to pick one because they have like categories called cottage core or just really calm, nice pastels. I ended up choosing the beige ruffle set just because I loved the way that it looked. I wanted something really calming because as you know before, my bed set was just black. Everything was black and dark and grim which was really nice for the winter especially because our room here in the new apartment is much smaller i wanted something that would brighten up the space make it look a bit more open and fresh and spacious and this honestly did the trick it is gorgeous with the light pouring in at the end of the day so if you guys are interested they kindly gave me a discount code for you so i will leave that in the description box but that is my new exciting bed set <laughs> Hi, it's me. I'm back. Um, it's been a long time since I've updated this one. Today is Tuesday. It's been like, I think a full week now almost since I've spoken to you. I am totally messing around with settings on my camera right now. Um, this is one of like the creative modes on it or whatever, but we're just gonna roll with it right now because I don't know. I like the cozy, cozy overtones, undertones. How? Oh God, I almost dropped this. How are we doing? Um, yes, thank you for asking. I am not doing well. I'm not well. I'm not doing well. I haven't been doing well for ooh, a little over a week straight now. I'm not gonna go into too much detail or anything. I'm always unsure in, you know, vlogs, which I know a lot of you guys say that you come for, for like comfort, to get a little bit of escapism, or just to get some like comforting, cozy vibes, which I hope, I gosh darn hope I can provide sometimes, but I'm never really sure how much to go into. You know, when I'm not feeling well, I wanna be super honest. Um, not even for the sake of being honest, but just because I just want these to be um, reality. I never want to be like, oh, I'm good, but I'm really not good because I'm really not good. I know a lot of you guys do appreciate and actually do feel a lot better um, when I talk about <laughs> how poorly I'm doing. And this week and the past week has uh, been one of those times, unfortunately. I've been in the lowest mental place, the worst mental space I've been in since a long time, a long time. Went home uh, this past weekend, so today's Tuesday, and I went home on Saturday. I stayed overnight and then I just came home Sunday, so a very short visit. It was quite painful to leave. Um, I did have a really nice time, I had a really nice visit. I went, you know, I was just basically outside um, for the whole 24 hours there, which was just Ooh, really needed. I hung out a lot with Evie, with my family. Moving here has just really made me appreciate my home um, so much more. I don't want to say I hate Toronto because that's not a good 
mindset to have, especially when I'm, I'm trying to live here. I'm trying to insert myself into life here. I'm trying to appreciate it. I'm trying to get a number of new fun experiences, which there have been. Do not get me wrong. Toronto has amazing things to do, but in general, I definitely want to say the honeymoon period of, you know, maybe the first couple of weeks living here since I've now been here for over a month, that's gone. It's worn off and I really hoped it was gonna stick around because I was really surprised at myself at how much I was liking it here but I think it, it just felt like I was on vacation for a couple of weeks which was fun and then it kind of hit me that I have to live here um, which again I feel like I should you know try and change these like I should say oh like I get to live here but like if I'm being completely honest I don't like it here <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, that feels completely true, so I know that's true, I don't like it here, and that's just, that's just the facts, you know, um, I've never liked, I've never liked cities, never liked big cities, never been into that, and the fact that, um, I just feel like I've lost a big part of myself, not being able to be in nature every day. I'm not gonna sit here and complain about city life too much because that's not really what this is about. It's just, um, yeah, it's just been really hard. I am trying my best to get out of this, although I don't wanna say it's just like a funk or anything. It's been like a trifecta of the mental, <laughs> the mental health department in my brain, <laughs> gone, shut down, they're on strike. I don't know where they've gone. I um, have been trying to go to the gym every single day and I did do that today again. So that is two days in a row now. Yesterday was yoga class. Today was yoga class. I think tomorrow I have another yoga class. Um, pretty much I've just been doing yoga classes, which are just phenomenal. It is now 2.42. I have not... I've been a little productive today. Honestly, I've been a little productive. I will speak to you very soon with some reading updates because I do have them. Last week, I also completed a 24 hour readathon with Carolyn, so I'll link that up above because that was so much fun and I read a bunch of books on that day, but I am still, of course, reading 100 Years of Solitude. It's going really well. I think I kind of need to pick up the pace because I'm trying to get this done before the month runs out and I am 258 pages through. There's been a lot that has been happening. Once again, spoilers for up to like 260-ish pages through, but we have finally had word of Rebecca because the 17 sons that Colonel Aureliano Wendia had have come back to Macondo one way or another, and one of them wants to stay in the house that Rebecca lives in because they think Rebecca died years ago, but he goes into the house. Everybody took it for granted that the lady of the house and the maid had died long before the wars were over, and that if the house was still standing, it was because in recent years there had not been a rough winter or destructive wind. The hinges had crumbled with rust, the doors were held up only by clouds of cobwebs, the windows were soldered shut by dampness, and the floor was broken by glass and wildflowers, and in the cracks, lizards and all manner of vermin had their nests. So Rebecca is still like inside the house, essentially. We have the we have the coming of the railroad to Macondo. There is a railroad line that gets built by, oh my God, Jose Arcadio, question mark. Medios, the beauty is lifted off to heaven. She um, levitates all the way up to heaven, abandoning with her the environment of beetles and dahlias and passing through the air with her as four o'clock in the afternoon came to an end and she was lost forever in the upper atmosphere where not even the highest flying birds of memory could reach her. We also have the arrival of the banana company, which is pretty significant because it will eventually um, bring up an actual event that happened in history. Ursula has gone blind, but she's kind of made it so that no one knows she's gone blind. She's now over a hundred years old and um, she's just wandering around the house and she's kind of memorized everything because every member of the family without realizing it repeated the same path every day, the same actions, and almost repeated the same words at the same hour. It's just been absolutely beautiful, full of so much like exquisite <laughs> misery, so many beautiful descriptions of misery and solitude and loneliness and the um, kind of revolutions of the family and that they're going around in circles have been starting to get more and more um, exaggerated, more and more noticeable and that like they're really just doing the same things over and over again. I also started Skyward, the audiobook, uh, during the 24 hour readathon and I'm almost halfway through this guy, uh, really not liking it. 
I'm so sad. I really, really am not liking this one. This is on my shelf for such a long time. I picked this up because it was a big booktube recommendation at the time. Honestly, this has got to be one of the most boring, um, maybe just science fiction in general or like sci-fi books I've ever read. I don't think the premise is really strong. Um, I'm finding the writing incredibly um, boring, repetitive, lackluster. Um, there are so many scenes that are just repeated that I feel like this book is a lot longer than it needs to be but if you're unfamiliar with this we follow Spencer who lives on this planet that is under attack by um, aliens known as the Krell who shoot them down whenever they try to leave and um, for years the people on the planet who think that they are the last remains of humankind have been fighting against them they've been like connecting and building um, troops groups squadrons of fighter pilots to fight the Krell um, so that hopefully they can eventually leave, I guess, because they had to, humanity had to crash land on this planet when they were traveling through space. Um, but Spencer, I just don't, like, I get it because we've kind of had something explained about why Spencer is the way she is. And I'm not talking about, um, like the fact that she's an unlikable character. I completely understand, but that is one of the main reasons why I'm not enjoying this book because Spencer is just so... Um, insufferable to follow. Essentially her father was one of the most famous fighter pilots but during one of the biggest most important battles against the Krell he deserted, he flew away and he was shot down and branded a coward and then her whole family was branded cowards as well which I don't like I guess I kind of understand that but I just find everyone's attitudes towards her like they're like oh you're such a coward you're just gonna run away you can't be a fighter pilot because you're just like your father I just think maybe it's taken a little too far to the point that it's a little bit unbelievable that every single person on this planet hates her because of her father's actions I guess in a society in the future where like your main source of survival um, depends on these fighter pilots fighting the Krell that is a bit more believable. It's not compelling enough to me. It's not, it's not, I'm not being sold on it. Do you know what I mean? It's something I keep questioning. I'm like, yeah, but why does everyone hate her? I'm like, why does everyone hate her that bad? Just because her father flew away. That's just kind of the way that the society has been built up to hate her. Anyway, her dream is to be a fighter pilot. So obviously she has this huge chip on her shoulder um, and she's just, um, <laughs> it's really hard to feel sympathy for her even though she's gone her whole life. Um, just bullied and be being called a coward. The levels of arrogance that she still maintains are just incredible. Um, she's like, oh, I can fly. I can fly easily. Get me in the spaceship right now. And I'm like, you've never flown. Um, it does have as well, I think the young adults, um, the young adult flaws of it just being too unbelievable because they literally have, she gets into flight school. They have one training session in like a hologram in a simulation. So it's not even actually going into outer space and like the next day they're like oh my gosh you guys have to go fight right now like we need you up there whereas hardly any of them have ever been in spaceships whatsoever and they're sending them out to fight and they end up like not dying at all and i'm like this just how like you've never been to outer space you've never flown a spacecraft and suddenly you're being put into battle and you can hold your own it's just really unbelievable the biggest thing aside from spensa who um, I know. I know there's gonna be character growth. I know. I just can't take her right now. Um, it's just the whole structure of this book is incredibly boring is the right word for me. I'm just, it, I'm finding it so dry, not exciting. I don't care. Brandon Sanderson is taking a lot of time in every single scene to describe what's going on, but the way that he describes things for me is very, um, static and it, it seems very, um, just seems very commercial and sterile in the way that, like, I'm like, okay, it took you like five seconds to write each sentence. Like, no wonder this man is the fastest writer ever. I'm sure his adult fantasy is worlds better, and that's really what I want to try, but this is just what I had with me, so I don't have any other Brando Sando on my shelf. There are endless fight scenes in space that are incredibly repetitive. Like, if I have to read the word destructor blast or hear them fake swearing, being like, oh, scud, one more time. That was my scathing review of Skyward, but I'm only halfway through, um, but I am struggling to be interested in this. I don't want to DNF it, but I'm just not having a good time with it. 
On the bright side, I have found a few little libraries, little free library boxes around here, and I actually got a book out of there um, a few days ago because I saw it and I was like, that looks incredible. And I can also count this to my Around the World challenge, and that is the Dirty Havana trilogy, um, which I've never heard of until I picked it out of the box, but it just sounded incredibly interesting. Um, it says, banned in Cuba, but celebrated throughout the Spanish-speaking world. It chronicles um, the misadventures of her author, who is a former Cuban journalist, living from hand to mouth in the squalor of contemporary Havana, half disgusted and half fascinated by the depths to which he has sunk. If anyone has heard of this or if you've read it, please let me know your thoughts. There are actually a few really good books in there, so I think I might go back and um, put a couple books of my own in the boxes and maybe see what else is in there, honestly, so. Who's gonna save you? Who's gonna make you? Good morning. I am feeling a lot better this morning. I got up to page 310 in Skyward, which is good because I really want to finish this. I have a theory of what's actually happening. With like the Krell, this isn't a spoiler, this is just my own theory. I really don't think they're aliens. I think they're just humans. I think they're just other humans because I've never actually seen a Krell. They don't know what they look like. I guess I can accept that aliens are shooting at them for forever, but it's just like, why? What are the aliens' motivations? What do they want? I'm about to head out to yoga class over lunch. I'm going to yoga classes over lunch because they're usually pretty much empty. There's only a few people there. We got Kels for a backpack, so I think we're gonna take him out for his first bigger trip in it tonight. If you've made it all the way to the end of this vlog, leave me um, leave me a little cat, a little cat emoji in the comments. And I want to say thank you so much for watching again. I hope you guys are all doing so well. Like I literally hope you're doing so well. And until the next one. That is when I will see you. So ciao.